If you like the podcast, don't forget to check us out on Instagram at What Happens in the Crypt. We're also on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. Innocent Jason. My only child. You have drowned. You never paid any attention. Look what you did to him. Look what you did to him. Hello, slashers, murderers, campers, and counselors. This episode is lucky number 13 of What Happens in the Crypt. Today we are talking about the 1980 film Friday the 13th. This classic is one of those ones that most people tend to forget about, and it also has a very young Kevin Bacon. I loved when we were watching this, we're like, wait a minute. Like, is it him? Is it him? (laughs) Is it actually Kevin Bacon? Yes, it is. Oh, it is Kevin Bacon. (laughs) This movie on the poster has the wonderful tagline of, They were warned. They are doomed. And on Friday the 13th, nothing will save them. <laughs> it's kind of lame. <laughs> it's, it's very lame. <laughs> Trigger warnings for this episode include gore, violence, and sexual situations. A brief synopsis of the story is, Ignoring the warnings of the local townspeople, Camp Crystal Lake is set to reopen. Previously, two other counselors had been murdered. The camp is said to be cursed after the drowning of a young boy. On Friday the 13th, the counselors begin to be picked off one by one. And speaking of ignoring warnings, as they like arrive into town, the townspeople refer to the camp as Camp Blood, but they're like, no, this is fine. Yeah, and they don't even like ask about it. Right, they're just like, lol, Camp Blood. Lol. <laughs> Dummies. There's a lot of great scenes in this movie, but the story to it really isn't complicated. The beginning, well, like the first three quarters of the movie is just young teens are going... Getting rowdy. <laughs> getting rowdy and going to the camp to get it ready because the this is before the campers are there. And they have like two or three... It's never really specified, but it's like two or three weeks to get everything ready for the kids. One of my favorite scenes in this movie, besides like all of the murders and the slasher stuff, is that scene where one of the camp counselors is talking to another one about like this thunder dream that she used to have. And this actually was the line that the women that auditioned for the role um, to be in this movie had to read. I had this dream about five or six times where I'm in a thunderstorm mm-hmm. and it's raining really hard. It sounds like pebbles when it hits the ground. I can hear it. I try to block out the sound with my hands, only it doesn't work. It just keeps getting louder and louder. And the rain turns to blood. And the blood washes away in little rivers. And the sound stops. That's Weird. not ominous. <laughs> not at all. It's really spooky. It it's is really very spooky. like that's the best writing of the whole movie. It's just that little line. Yeah, and I do like that. That's like the audition line because it's mm-hmm. the. I mean, other than the end stuff, this is like the only real, right? Spooky stuff. Like the only like foreboding yeah. moments. Now on the flip side, they decide to play strip monopoly. Because that makes sense. I just, I I understand, like, adding stripping to board games, but Monopoly would be the worst one by far. Because they also, like, deal the money out. So how does that work? And it would take so long. Like, the premise was, like, instead of paying rent, you pay in clothes. But, like, you would it, be naked so fast? It takes so long for people to, like, build up their houses, hotels. I don't like Monopoly, so... <laughs> No, it would happen. I can't remember how the actual game It would game happen play goes. very quickly. Okay. Like, you don't have to pay, like, a lot of money really quickly, but you have to, if you, you know, you land on somebody's thing right right at the beginning, it's like $12, but still, you'd have to pay. Right, I guess that makes sense, but if they also have money, at what point, like, do you have to run out of money to start paying in clothes? I don't know. I didn't, they didn't go over the rules. 
I just, I needed more information. It's just a weird scene. I feel like they just were like, yeah, it's a slasher movie. We got to show somebody in their underwear. And then the one girl, it's like pouring rain, is like down to her bra and underwear. And she's like, well, we'll finish this game later. And she leaves without all of her clothes. (laughs) She just doesn't care about them. Doesn't give a fuck. When she leaves Strip Monopoly, it's clearly pouring outside and there's a thunderstorm going on. And Kevin Bacon and his girlfriend, I think, they I don't know if they ever really say. They're like camp counselor couples. It's not real. Well, they came together, but whatever. <laughs> it's not real. So the thunderstorm is happening. And those two are kind of off on this own, in, in like a separate cabin. And they're just, you know, hardcore making out. <laughs> Obviously. After their makeout scene, Marcy goes to the bathroom, which is like a separate building. So now Kevin Bacon is alone. Kevin Bacon is laying there, and um, from underneath the mattress, he gets stabbed through the neck, and it's really gruesome. Oh, yeah. It's just, it's, it's, he should get stabbed through the neck, and then you should just hear a whisper that just goes, Tom Savini. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then the camera pans out a little and you see another camper that's been murdered in the top bunk. Yeah, and it's really... Because he has no idea that there's anybody there. And suddenly right. just an arm comes out from under the bed, holds his neck down, and then he just... You see... It's like a... It's either a knife or an arrow, I don't quite know. It just comes straight through his neck. And just this beautiful, gory... Tom, Tom Savini, Savini moment. moment. Yeah. <laughs> After Kevin Bacon is quickly dispatched... And you see the two bodies, it goes to Marcy, who is now in the bathroom in a very weird scene. (laughs) She's doing what I guess is supposed to be a Catherine Hepburn impression, um, but it's really creepy. And for some reason, it just like makes my skin crawl. And she's saying something like, I'd always be ugly, I said, or something weird. And she's just talking to herself. And as Sean pointed out, when we watched it, she's like blazed out of her mind, I think, because yeah. they've been smoking. Yeah. I don't know. It's very strange. When I looked into that mirror, I knew I'd always be ugly. I said, Lizzie, you'll always be plain. But so she's in the bathroom, and of course she gets. It's that classic bathroom scene of, huh? Who's, who's there? Who's yeah. there? <laughs> and it's just like you are in your underwear in a what, like a little poncho. Yeah, talking to yourself. Talking in the to yourself, mirror. and you hear something. It's like you're just gonna walk over to it. At least pick up, I don't know, a broom, anything, literally anything. No, and then she gets axed in the face. And another beautiful Tom, Tom Savini, Savini moment. That one is like, that that prosthetic must have taken so long. Yeah, it's amazing. Because it looks awesome. Yeah, definitely holds up for sure. Because it is an axe literally in her face. Mm-hmm. And then it's another counselor down. <laughs> one of the details of this movie that I always forget, um, obviously we know that in this first one, Jason is not the killer, but it's actually Jason's mom. But I totally forget that she does that voice when oh, she approaches the counselors him. yeah oh gosh, where she's so like creepy. she's like regular and then she's just like kill her mommy <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah horrifying cuz she gets like a little quieter but more high pitched yeah kill her mom kill her yeah kill her mommy Ugh, and it's like a close up of her teeth and it's just like oof kill her mommy kill her kill her mommy kill her It is oof, because it's just like, imagine being in their shoes, and it's just, you, you, this person has a weapon of some kind, an axe, a knife, something, Mm -hmm. and she's whispering to herself, kill her mom. Yeah, and she like has a a full conversation. Get him, mom. She's like, I will, Jason. (laughs) It's like, oh no. It's like, oh no, this is terrifying, (laughs) beyond all comprehension. The end of this movie has two important scenes. The first one being our final girl, what's her name again? Alice. Alice, our final girl, Alice, in the canoe that she has slept in after beheading Jason's mom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she's sleeping in this canoe, and Jason, all make up, just. From the depths. From the depths. Just gruesome looking, but he's only on screen for a couple seconds. 
and drags her into the water. Mm -hmm. And then after that, she just shoots up in a hospital bed. And it's kind of just like a, did that happen? Right. Did it not happen? It's all right now, Alice. It's all over. Are they all dead? Yes, ma'am. Two of my men pulled you out of the lake. We thought you were dead, too. Do you remember very much? The boy. Is he dead, too? Who? The boy, Jason. It's like... I'm pretty sure it happened because they fu they said they found her in the water, not in the canoe. Right. And the fact that they're like, what happened to the boy? And they're mm -hmm. like, well, we have no idea. Right. It's like, sequels. Obviously, we know there's sequels now. <laughs> there's a million sequels. So it did happen. But it's just cool that it at first, when the original came out, it's like a, well, there won't there be another right. one. But I'm happy there's more. <laughs> and we'll do episodes on more of them. Maybe. No, we have to. We definitely will. Because the si I love the second one as well. Because the second one is pre-Hockey Mask. Hmm. Second one is just Mommy's head on a table. Yeah, the one I've seen most recently is Freddy versus Jason, which is silly. No, that's the last one. Hmm? The reason why this movie looks so good is the world-famous Tom Savini. Tom Savini. After seeing his work in Dawn of the Dead, basically everybody wanted him to do their movies. Right, and he's obviously amazing, but he has like such a specific signature without it being a signature. You can just tell when he is the person that's created the effects. Any horror movie you're watching, you're like, damn, that looks good. And Tom then you look Savini. it up and you're like, oh, yeah, Tom Savini did yeah. it, of course. But it's, yeah, it's not even a signature. It's just like a... Dang, that looked so mm -hmm. good. It's the Tom Savini dang effect. Dang. <laughs> Friday the 13th was shot in New Jersey at Camp Nobi... Bosco. Nobi Bosco. Nobi Bosco. Nobi Bosco. That is a mouthful, but it was shot there. The camp is actually operating as a summer camp still to this day. The camp worked out so perfectly that basically every shot on... The location was just there, and the only thing they really had to build was the bathroom scene. Mm -hmm. During production, to kind of stay in high spirits and just, like, in the right mindset, a lot of the cast and crew opted into just staying there at the campsite in some of the cabins. And, and this includes Tom Savini. I love that, too. I feel like if I ever was on, like, a film set that was on location, I'd want to stay there. Cause just, like, fully immerse yourself in it. And actually, while they stayed there, Tom Savini brought a Betamax player so that they could watch horror movies. That oh, he that's brought. cool. <laughs> and there were three or four different movies, and they said that all the cast and crew that stayed there can word for word say all the movies that he brought because <laughs> they watched them so much. Yeah. In the beginning of the movie, a snake gets into one of the cabins, and they're, like, trying to catch it or kill it, and it's, like, squirming around. It goes under a dresser, and they end up, like, macheteing it yeah, in but, half. Yeah. <laughs> and um, this is actually inspired because of while Tom Savini was staying at a cabin on location, a snake got into his cabin. And basically, yeah, the same thing happened. And unfortunately with this scene, though... By all rumors and accounts, this was a real snake that really got macheted in half. That is really sad. Kind of metal, though. It's metal, but, like, this poor <laughs> snake was just trying to get out. Yeah. R.I.P. R.I.P. snake. Yeah. Some of the latex material needed to actually be baked, like, for the fake um, prosthetics, like, the faces that get cut off and stuff. And Savini actually used the camp's pizza ovens <laughs> to bake the silicone for his prosthetics because that's what he had on hand. That's awesome. <laughs> I hope they still have the same ovens right? today. <laughs> They're like, did you know that Kevin Bacon's fake neck was baked in this pizza oven? <laughs> And you just look down at your pizza, you're like, I don't know if that makes this better or worse. <laughs> the death scene with Kevin Bacon actually took hours for them to set up because the prosthetic they used was gigantic and it was like a full torso and neck and finding a way to set up the correct angle for that like under the bed slice, I guess, took hours. Yeah, 
I can only imagine how long that would take. Because also Kevin Bacon has to be propped up in such a way that you can fit a neck like, right. under. Because it's not only fitting a neck above him, but it's also like you have to pierce it. Mm -hmm. So it's like the blood and everything else shoots out and so it looks real. One of the earlier shots in the movie shows Brenda getting like the archery um cushions set up. I don't know what those are actually called. Targets. The targets, but yeah. it's whatever. It's soft. So I said cushion. The archery target. And an arrow gets shot like bullseye right next to her. And that actually was Tom Savini that shot that arrow. Because I guess he's really good Wait, at archery. He shot that arrow? I thought yeah. it was just like an effect. No, he shot it. I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Two years before this movie came out, Halloween was released in theaters. Victor Miller was asked to write Friday the 13th and was in interviews says that he was told to rip Halloween off. Just so weird. The movie had made so much money that basically every production company, everybody wanted to make the next Halloween. The original title of this movie was A Long Night at Camp Blood. It does not roll off the tongue. No. Glad they changed it. Basically, Victor Miller was asked to write a script that was bloody, entertaining, and could be made cheap. <laughs> this movie was low budget, considering all things like, you know, most movies have millions of dollars. So this was made for $500,000, but it ended up making over $59 million. That's wild. They also took out ad space in newspapers advertising the movie like way before they were done and they would just like put it out there to start drum up interest because they were trying to follow that like halloween shadow <laughs> people still being really interested in slasher movies that's smart though like i know it was the people behind this movie saw halloween and then immediately just like yeah. we gotta do this yeah. we gotta copy it it doesn't it's just like we gotta right. do it <laughs> And it was smart. I mean, this it ended up being good, so... And making a ton of money. Mm -hmm. During production, they wanted to keep an air of mystery to the killer. That's why, for um, for most of the killings in this movie, you never see who is doing it. It's just kind of like... they're Somebody's getting stabbed and falling over dead, and it's just kind of like a first-person point of view. They actually got the idea from this. The inspiration behind this was Jaws. <laughs> I get it, but Jaws is a shark. It's not faceless. This could be a witch or a demon or a human. We don't know. <laughs> yep. But it just, it's like place of the, the creep, the creepiness to it. You're like, I don't know who's doing this. Got it. <laughs> the only time you hear music in this movie is when the killer is present. So that kind of adds to the faceless killer we don't see them we don't know what's happening but we know that they're around when the music is on adds to the suspense as well right because even like in the scene where the arrow hits the target there's no music because it was just like pranks <laughs> and not actually the killer harry manfredini was the composer that came up with the music that uh classic like all right we're both gonna do our best rendition okay because I always say, ch, 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 ah, ah, ah. And I always go, ch, 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 ah, ah, ah. <laughs> We actually did it at the end of the last episode. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Here yeah. we go again. Yep, it's again. But apparently we were both wrong. Right, because the sound is actually, I'm just going to say it, is ki, 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 ma, ma, ma. Ki, 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 ma, ma, ma. Good job. <laughs> And this is from the final reel of the film. When Mrs. Voorhees arrives and is saying, Killer Mommy, he took that K-I sound from Kill and the Ma from Mommy. And he actually recorded himself saying the two words, Kill and Mommy, really harshly and distinctly into a microphone and ran them through something called an echo reverberation machine, which became the noise that we all know and everyone says it's cha 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 <laughs> and it's not it's ki 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 <laughs> yeah i have no idea what that machine is but me either <laughs> i mean it's great every if anybody hears that they know oh yeah friday the 13th right. jason, or jason yeah they know exactly what it's from 
No yeah. matter if it's ki 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 ma ma ma. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds funnier. It does. Ki 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 ma ma ma. Like mambo number five is going to happen. <laughs> oh, no. Every time Jason shows up, it plays mambo number five. <laughs> Somebody edit that. I'll edit that. <laughs> no. I'll get back to you, internet. There's a moment at the end where Mrs. Miss Voorhees, Mrs. Voorhees, Miss Voorhees, whatever, Miss Voorhees slaps final girl. Alice, uh -huh. that's it, Alice, <laughs> and in rehearsal, she actually slapped her so hard that she cried, and this was because the actress who played Miss Voorhees uh, was a was known for theater, and she w basically just told her to suck it up. Theater's real. Right. You're gonna really do this, and the director Sean Cunningham had to be like, no, 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 no. This is fake. Nobody is supposed to be hurt here. <laughs> right. You can't actually smack her. Which is wild. But, you know, people who were, you know, from black and white films from the 50s, 60s. They did it for real. They did it for real. Things were different, done differently back then. But that's just like a wild little fun fact that we found. Uh... Speaking of Mrs. Voorhees, she was played by Betsy Palmer, R.I.P. R.I.P. Um, she actually wanted nothing to do with this movie, and she was literally quoted as saying the script was a piece of shit. <laughs> but right when they offered her the role, her car broke down, and they paid her $1,000 a day to be on set and to play this character. And so she did it so she could get a new car. Hey, man. Whatever it takes. A new car is a new car. <laughs> The classic ending with Jason coming out of the water actually wasn't in the script, and the idea came later as they were filming, and shocker, Tom Savini has taken credit for this idea, because he's great, um, saying that he was inspired by Carrie, and that classic ending of Carrie where she reaches her arm up to grab the girl's ankle. Mm -hmm. That's a good movie. Mm -hmm. The original one is. Yeah. Not the remake. Yeah, no. <laughs> To no one's surprise, there was a huge bidding war for who could produce it. There were so many companies that wanted their name slapped on this movie that I believe the the bid was like $1.5 million to be able to put this movie out. And this again was due to because every company saw how well Halloween had done. When this movie like played, before it played to audiences, obviously it plays to like movie executives. When As soon as it ended... Everybody sent them an offer. Right. <laughs> there are ten deaths in total in this movie. Nine camp counselors die at the hands of the vengeful Pamela Voorhees before she is decapitated by our final girl, Alice. Our first death is camp counselor Barry, who is stabbed in the stomach with a hunting knife. Our second death is Claudette, who's also stabbed with a hunting knife in the neck. Supposed to be, soon to be, chef Annie Phillips has her throat slashed with a hunting knife. And this is our first, like, dang, Tom Savini death because yeah. she gets her throat slashed and it looks very gruesome, very realistic. And you think she's going to be a main character because it, like, shows her making her way downtown, getting to camp. And she's the first one that they show. And then it's that first-person perspective and, you, like, a knife slashes mm -hmm. across the scr screen and then her neck and... That that's like the the we keep saying the Tom Savini dang, and it's because there's no cut. It just right. it you see the knife slash, and then her neck just splits open, and blood comes spurting out. And it's it's because of the practical effects are done so well that Tom you don't have to cut away and then cut right. back to it. It's just all then there, and it looks so good. And interesting note about her is that this was her like claim to fame this actress right. and there's an interview where she brags about it still to this day and her, she even jokes that her husband will be like my wife is the first <laughs> counselor to die yeah and it looked so good she got her neck slit open <laughs> hey wasn't that the road up for camp crystal lake back there Our fourth death is Ned Rubenstein, 
whose throat is also slashed with a hunting knife. Likes that hunting knife. She keeps it on, what, she keeps that knife on it's her like hip. It's like on a holster, yeah. yeah. Kevin Bacon. Hey, I was right. It actually is an arrow. That, uh, another, such a good-looking stab. No cut, no anything. He's just laying there in bed and then just an arrow. Drop my phone. Just an arrow straight through his neck. And just looks so good, so brutal. Our sixth death is Marcy Stanler, face struck with an axe in that classic bathroom brutal scene. That is probably like the most brutal and scariest looking one. Just because you see the entire axe stuck in her face. Mm -hmm. Camp owner Steve Christie is our seventh death and he is stabbed in the chest with a hunting knife. Our eighth death is Bill, and he's probably one of the other most memorable, gory deaths. He's the one that's hanging on the back of the door, and he has his throat slashed with a hunting knife, and he's impaled with multiple arrows. Yeah, that's another one where you're like, oh, damn! Right? In an interview with Tom Savini, too, he said that he walked around in that makeup all day because he thought it was so fun and that he has pictures of them together. I would totally do that. <laughs> Brenda's our ninth death, and it's kind of unknown what happens to her, but she gets thrown through that window, and she's covered in the rope, so she's, she's multiple wounds, probably stabbed, too. And that scene is so jarring, too, because yeah. Alice is, like, kind of boarded up the place, and then she leans up against the fridge and goes, what am I gonna do? And then she just comes crashing through the window. Yeah. Our final death is Pamela Voorhees herself, R.I.P., decapitated with a machete pretty cool scene though yeah it's pretty awesome it looks really good too tom savini <laughs> just anytime you see a tom savini <laughs> daddy just whisper just tom savini yeah somewhere or dang or dang <laughs> depends on what kind of no they should just is. put a little sound bite in the movie itself whenever there's a tom <laughs> savini death you just hear in the background just tom savini <laughs> This first movie is seriously so different from the rest in the series, and it's really good for that reason. Um, the story is intense, and the vengeful, murderous mother is really, really well done. Um, like, in the later series, it's just, like, a unkillable monster, and in this one, the human aspect really adds to the horror part of it. Um, I'd say it hasn't really aged super well <laughs> as far as, like, the dialogue and some of the situations, and it's real campy for that reason, but it's still really great and definitely a classic. I would say this is definitely a, like, this This one specifically is a classic horror movie, and I would say 1 and 2 are my favorites of the Friday the 13th, definitely, because the the later ones are just like, he's in a hockey mask, and... He's just showing up for some reason, and it plays more into the... For some reason, it's always, like, the same backstory of he drowned, and it never really adds anything new. It's just kind of like a... We can shoot him 20 times, and he's gonna keep coming. And it's just kind of boring, because it's like, how... You, okay, you can't kill him. You're just all gonna die now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but 1 and 2, it's... It, it's more realistic, and it's like, this could be a... Well, unfortunately, it could yeah, really happen. right, because it's not supernatural. It is a woman who is a psycho and is grieving the death of her son, and then the second one is, like, a little murky, but he actually survived. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he he's just kind of like a rage ghoul. <laughs> he's come back <laughs> out of pure ghoul. rage. And, uh... Because he doesn't have the, the you know, his... Uh, hockey mask yet he's he's he just wears a sack on his head and he's killing people with random objects it's like because i remember specifically he killed somebody with a pitchfork yeah that's another episode though it's a different episode but in my opinion one and two are the best definitely worth a watch this is available to rent on youtube and amazon prime it's not really streaming anywhere right now for free next week we're talking about the 1968 classic night of the living dead our oldest movie to date. Is that our first black and white one? I think so. It yes, is. definitely. It is definitely our first black and white movie. I'm very excited for this. It's another one of my favorites. Thompson.